The Lockheed F-104 Starfighter, the aircraft with a science fiction name, on its debut in 1954, and perhaps even today, it appears as something seemingly straight out of science fiction. The Starfighter was a radical design at the time, when many aircraft were growing in size. The Starfighter had thin, stubby wings placed far back on the fuselage, giving it a very rocket-like appearance and performance. One nickname for the aircraft was the missile with a man in it. It was the first production aircraft to achieve Mach 2, and the first to reach an altitude of 100,000 feet, taking off under its own power. In 1958, the Starfighter was the first aircraft to ever hold simultaneous records for airspeed, altitude, and time to climb. The pre-production YF-104A reached Mach 2 for the first time on the 27th of April 1956. To put this speed in perspective, a P-51D Mustang, a dominant fighter aircraft in 1945, 11 years before the speed was accomplished, had a top speed of around 440 miles per hour. So the Starfighter was about 3.5 times faster than most fighters during World War II. Even by today's standards, the Starfighter remains fast, over 300 miles per hour faster than an F-35C. The Starfighter was designed by one of the world's most celebrated aviation designers, Kelly Johnson. Johnson headed up the design team at Lockheed and was inspired directly by interviews with Korean warfighter pilots. Pilots wanted to be able to outrun and outclimb Soviet MiGs. The unique small wing design would need significant testing. The design had its skeptics. Extensive wind tunnel testing was performed, along with more atypical tests involving bolting wings to rockets. The fuselage would end up two and a half times as long as the airplane's 21-foot, 11-inch, or 6.36-meter wingspan. The small wings were incredibly thin, with the leading edge only 0.41 millimeters. They were so thin, they posed a hazard to ground crews. Protective guards were installed on them during maintenance. The thin wings required the fuel tanks and landing gear to be placed in the fuselage. The small wings further required rethinking of how to slow the plane for landing. Both leading and trailing edge flaps were used, and a boundary layer control system. This system bled off excess air from the jet engine's turbine air compressor. High pressure is rerouted through small metal tubes integrated into the wings, ahead of the wing flaps, improving lift, and allowing for lower approach speeds. Touchdown speed remained a blistering 155 to 160 knots. Powerful brakes and a 16-foot drag chute aided in landings. Speed was not just an issue on landing, but takeoff as well. Starfighter pilots needed to quickly raise the landing gear on takeoff before exceeding the maximum landing gear operating speed. The F-104 was designed to use the General Electric J-79 turbojet engine, optimized for performance at Mach 1.7, and later Mach 2 for the F-104s equipped with the more powerful J-79 GE-19 engines. Armament for the 104 was the 20mm M61 Vulcan autocannon. It was the first aircraft to carry the weapon. The Starfighter had the honor of sorting out the kinks of the Vulcan for future aircraft. The gun had initial feeding problems with the linked ammunition. Discarded links were occasionally sucked into the engine. A linkless ammunition feed system was eventually developed. Two Sidewinder air-to-air -air missiles could be carried on the wingtip stations, which could also be used for fuel tanks. The F-104C and later models added a centerline pylon and two underwing pylons for bombs, rocket pods, or fuel tanks. The centerline pylon could further carry a nuclear weapon. Starfighters were also capable of carrying and launching a rocket-powered nuclear missile, but the configuration for this system was not adopted for service use. The Vulcan cannon was removed on some variants for additional missile guidance capability, for all-weather interceptors. The Starfighter was at every stage of its use and development, teaching valuable and costly lessons. 
The ejection seat is one example. Early starfighters used a downward firing ejection seat. This was due to concerns of the seat not clearing the tail assembly. Downward firing ejection seats can be, and were deadly at low altitudes, resulting in 21 failed escapes by United States Air Force pilots before a change was made. Ejections are more common on single-engine aircraft like the Starfighter, with no second engine to rely on during a failure. Apart from speed and altitude, the aircraft's other impressive capability was inexpensive and easy production. 20 Starfighters per day could come off a single assembly line. The aircraft was designed for modular assembly and disassembly, Wings were bolted to the fuselage rather than going through the plane. The aircraft's ease of assembly and size made it ideal for transport. The Starfighter was first transported and quickly assembled for combat during the Taiwan Strait Crisis of 1958, where they were used to demonstrate American air superiority and act as a deterrent. They were again used for such purposes in the Berlin Crisis of 1961, where they demonstrated very quick reaction times against potential Soviet threats. During the Vietnam War, starfighters were used as multi-role fighters and fighter bombers. Starfighters were deployed extensively as a barrier combat air patrol protector, protecting early warning aircraft. 104s deterred MiG interceptors. They were largely uninvolved in aerial combat, with no air-to-air -air kills during the war. It was believed that MiGs avoided engaging them. A total of 14 F-104s were lost in Vietnam, primarily to either ground fire or accidents. One was down September 20, 1965, to a Chinese-built MiG-19. The Starfighter's first air-to-air -air combat victory was achieved by the Pakistan Air Force during the Indo-Pakistani War of 1965. In September of 1965, an Indian Mistair 4 was shot down by a sidewinder fired by a lone Pakistani Starfighter, while another was damaged by its Vulcan autocannon. Starfighters claimed several air-to-air -air victories during the war and subsequent Indo-Pakistani War of 1971. In 1967, during the Taiwan Strait conflict, Starfighters shot down two MiG-19s for the loss of one Starfighter. The Starfighter was faster than most early Cold War Soviet aircraft, but the aircraft could not turn with the majority of its adversaries. Because of its small razor-thin wings, it had incredibly high wing loading, and was unsuitable for low-speed maneuvering. It was a most formidable aircraft if used in high-speed surprise attacks. It was exceptionally stable at high speeds above Mach 1.2. This made it an excellent tactical nuclear strike fighter or bomber interceptor. Its high speed kept it attractive for other duties, including reconnaissance. However, turning performance was so poor that starfighter pilots would say they turned by banking with intent to turn. If the 104 were to engage with an enemy aircraft, they'd simply have to turn into the 104 and survive the first pass. A 104 could only make so many boom and zoom maneuvers on an enemy aircraft due to its limited fuel capacity. Ultimately, the 104's best potential was as a quick high-speed altitude aircraft, one that could intercept Soviet bombers threatening NATO with a nuclear strike. It also had excellent offensive potential, to quickly deliver retaliatory nuclear strikes. However, by the 1960s, it was determined that intercontinental ballistic missiles would be delivering warheads to American cities, not bombers. Despite this, the 104 remained in service well past being retired by the United States Air Force in 1969. The Starfighter flew with 15 different air forces, and many were licensed-built, like the Canadair CF-104, of which 200 were built. Safety and performance varied from country to country for a multitude of reasons. No nation experienced a worse accident record for the Starfighter than Western Germany. The Germans lost 292 of 916 aircraft and a staggering 116 pilots killed between 1961 and 1989. Its high accident rate earned it the nickname Widowmaker from the German public. Though the aircraft had major safety issues, losses in Germany were not strictly a result of the aircraft alone. Poor training conditions for pilots and crews were a result of West Germany's sudden and budgeted restart of the Luftwaffe in 1956. 
Many pilots and ground crew who served in World War II, for example, were given refresher courses, thrown too quickly into a new generation of aircraft. The United States Air Force required starfighter pilots to have at least 1,500 flight hours of experience before flying the F-104. West German pilots had around 400 hours. West Germany further used the 104 as a low-level fighter-bomber, where it performed more poorly than as a high-speed, high-altitude fighter-interceptor. A further issue for the German starfighter F-104G was the addition of extra weight and an overwhelming amount of avionic equipment, such as the inertial navigation system. In later years, structural problems in the wings occurred, with the wings taking significant high G-force loading cycles, Many airframes were retired earlier than anticipated. Marring the reputation of the Starfighter in Germany was not only the aircraft's performance, but the Lockheed bribery scandals, which was a series of bribes and contributions by Lockheed officials starting in the 1950s, running into the 1970s. 22 million in bribes to foreign officials took place to ensure lucrative foreign sales of the aircraft. The scandal involved Italy, the Netherlands, Japan, and West Germany. The German made-for-TV movie from 2015 titled Starfighter explores the Starfighter's controversial place in Cold War West Germany. It's worth watching if you can find a copy of it. The Starfighter, given its name, its look, its worldwide availability, and its reputation, has been featured in many productions. A Starfighter even managed to intercept the Enterprise on one occasion in a Star Trek original series episode. I can see it now. Whatever this thing is, it's big. There is one film, The Starfighters from 1964, which is entirely dedicated to the aircraft and pilots. It features extensive footage of the aircraft, but can only barely be called an entertaining movie. One review states it's one of the worst films ever produced. Watch it if you're just looking for some stock footage. Or, if you're a mystery science theater fan, watch the Starfighters while enjoying some hilarious commentary. So basically, according to themselves, the Air Force is a bunch of leather-faced, not-so-bright, heavy-drinking, dull-witted speed freaks who poop in their pants and can't make it with women, right? Uh, Am I right? Yes, I'm not that is say. correct. I think it's a... The best overall movie featuring the Starfighter is The Right Stuff from 1983. The film covers the U.S. space program's development, right from breaking the sound barrier to the first American human spaceflight program, Project Mercury, with its first manned flight, May 5, 1961. The Starfighter was an important plane to NASA, serving from 1956 until 1994. F-104s with their high speed and high altitude capability conducted numerous tests and chase flights in support of advanced research aircraft. They further provided a launch platform for test rockets. In The Right Stuff, at the end of the film, Chuck Yeager is shown, as true to history, attempting to break a high-altitude record in December of 1963. In the movie, he is shown flying an F-104G starfighter. The actual plane flown during the event was an NF-104A, a demilitarized starfighter that had a 27 kilonewton rocketine engine used for astronaut training. It was capable of reaching altitudes of up to 120,800 feet. Jaeger lost control during the attempt and was nearly killed. He lost the tips of two fingers and received burns to his face after ejecting from the aircraft. In 1947, Jaeger became the first pilot in history confirmed to have exceeded the speed of sound in level flight. He remains one of the greatest test pilots who has ever lived. In 1962, Jaeger became the first commandant of the United States Air Force Aerospace Research Pilot School, which produced astronauts for NASA. Alright, I'm Johnny. Thanks for watching. Take care, have a nice day, and may your ejection seats always be pointed to the sky.